the end of the stage. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, a thank for the invitation here, also to get here this prize lecture, more of the Roma. You can play around. And uh, I would, because actually this lecture is a bit sponsored by EPJ, and I'm actually editor in chief of these two journals, which I will be quickly flash. And we get some propaganda, not only to submit everything to the APS, because we live in Europe, and sometimes you should also have an alternative to APS journals. And I would wish we would have more submissions from European authors, and particular I'd like to advertise. If you have a group of people, if you have an interesting modern topic which is just at the verge of coming out, you can actually act as a guest editor and always put forward a focus issue and things like that. Or you can actually, if you have a little meeting, and you can then actually put here uh, uh, a collection of about 15 people together and everybody can will get at the end uh, a free copy of that special issue in need to change uh, special topics. So having said about that, these are two EPJ journals, which I am actually in command of. I will now start with the talk. And this talk is essentially based on a recent paper, which is as fixed as almost a little booklet. So if you want to criticize this work, you have to read it actually more than once. It has a lot of footnotes, because this work is actually in the making since about four years. And uh, finally, we put everything together in this paper, together with Stefan Hilbert and Jörn Dunkel, because we had many discussions with distinguished colleagues, and many of distinguished colleagues always try to pick a hole in the second law or in our formulation of entropies, but I can tell you really few of them all. Of course, there are some people which do not follow this, they just put up archives saying that everything we do is incorrect. But of course, I do not even react on those because it's full of logical errors if you don't talk to me before. Now, the first thing starts already with the second law, because the second law is actually stated in most books, and here I'm guilty myself. I must say that my present notes, I teach fundamental disk mechanics since about 25, 30 years, I still have to correct my notes each year. Because what I say 10 years ago or 5 years is simply not correct. It's almost correct because I say the same things as in the books, but the books are not correct. <laughs> and we learn more and more. Because everybody knows, for example, the second law due to Clausius, that spontaneous heat can flow from in a material from a lower temperature from cold to hot. This is one formulation, and the other one is actually not even equivalent, which I don't even really mention. And the more precise, uh, formulation of the second law is due to Clausius also, which is actually written down here, where you have, so to speak, a thermal equilibrium state at a certain temperature, and another equilibrium state here, and now we have a spontaneous irreversible process where you can reach the second thermal state here by a irreversible <coughs> process. And that's what's now important, where what you can also reach the second thermal state by a reversible process. And now, of course, what is important in the modern formulation, of course, this was done about 10 years after the statement of heat flowing uh, from hot to cold, uh, introduced the, so to call it, uh, the integrating factor, and they introduced here, so to speak, in a modern language this law, which, of course, you will never find uh, unless you know the answer in these papers. But essentially, the change of heat over a cycle over temperature that temperature T is less than zero. And you see now, the first problem here you have as a good student, fortunately no student ever asked me this question. And uh, first of all is, what is actually T here? You know, uh, what is actually meaning of this T? And this you think, uh, if you, professor thinks long about it, oh, this is absolute temperature, and, uh, actually, but this is the temperature of, of thermal baths. You have maybe here many thermal paths in order to calculate here with the reversible path, so that's actually a reasonable answer. But actually you, you have actually, as you may see, many absolute temperatures. In particular, this assumes that T is a positive quantity, because if T would be negative, you would have a change of sign. And why is this T absolutely positive? That's already a good question from a student, which I fortunately never get asked. 
And uh, but for example, we have a spin bath. People now think that we can have absolutely negative temperature. And I'm actually telling you, be careful using this term. And the other object is this delta Q, because this delta Q is only known <coughs> to me when the temperature which is positive times dS is the irreversible heat. And this irreversible heat here is actually a, not a strange object, because you have no formula for it. And in particular, if the system interacts with the bath, with the area, uh, with, with air or whatever is around, and it has a finite interaction, I tell you this professor will have a hard time to ever define what uh, the uh, irreversible heat is. Because the interaction, you don't know, the energy interaction is this part of the system or the part of the bath. And this is an unsolved problem, which is pretty important in quantum mechanics. Anyhow, and what of course is not allowed in Augsburg is what sometimes you have see. So the entropy changes here, you see, is always between thermal states. So, so you're not allowed to, uh, to take non-thermal energies uh, entropy is very, so to speak, and entropy would depend on time. In terms of dynamics, no entropy is a function of time. And as you see now, for example, the change of entropy here, if, if you have a, a isolated, a thermally isolated state, then the Q is for sure is zero. Never mind, uh, this when is zero, so it gets it, the change of entropy is always positive. Okay, this is, so to speak, a one form of the second law, which uh, which assumes it can say that you actually, even in this case, you must have a positive temperature. And this is a guiding concept which I actually is very deep, in, uh, which I follow very deeply. This is actually goes back to uh, Eddington. You know, there, were many, there might be many theories which you might even uh, Maxwell's equation is here as an example. Are they actually totally correct? Maybe they are correct, as long as the experiments do not find the contradiction to them. If they are wrong, it's too bad for Mr. Maxwell, because sometimes people think they are correct to the Maxwell equation, to the quantum effects, etc. But if whatever theory you do, it's also what Einstein said, quantum mechanics, special relativity, general relativity, whatever you do, you should not build up a belief in a theory which is actually found to be in contradiction with the so-called second law. And that, of course, as you say, if you have that, you should collapse in shame or deepest humiliation. Keep that in mind. So at least I make sure, or at least I, uh, uh, all in my papers, I hope that I never made a mistake with the second law. The second law sometimes is confused with the so-called minus first law. In mathematical physics, actually, this is now important. Uh, this is a difference between thermodynamics, which is related to the second law, and the minus first law means it's actually a law which you need in order to define thermodynamics in the first place. Then we all have a container, have here an initial preparation, and as a function of time, you reach so to speak the thermal state. And of course, when this mathematically, this you write as an inequality, like uh, so to speak, like an H function, or a Lyapunov function, or whatever it's called, there are many entropic measures for that. But this has nothing to do with the, with the second law. In mathematics, in mathematics, many people call this the second law because it's an inequality larger than equal zero. So not everything which is larger than equal zero is the second law <laughs> in inequalities. But here in thermodynamics, you must have all this equilibrium state. So you have a control. For example, this is a constrained equilibrium, which is an upper constrained equilibrium, which is an unconstrained equilibrium, and then you know the change between these two thermal equilibrium states has to be positive for normal systems like these gases. Now, let me see, does this work actually? Yeah. And now I come to the issue of entropy. In this famous book, which usually is not read by anyone, but you can actually download it easily on the web. It's a bit hard to read because Hitz is a guy who knows a lot, but you don't understand easy his writing. His English is very strange. In the chains admits that. But in this work, actually, he introduces four different entropies. One is the famous uh, Gibbs Shannon entropy, which you hear in courses, which is essentially P L and P with the canonical distribution function. And he introduces actually two more for the micro canonical average. And maybe this is the proof. But he introduces here, so this works the total volume, and a phase space volume takes the logarithmic value, the so LN in modern language, of the total phase volume. And this is actually what I call from now on 
the Gibbs entropy for the microcanonical ensemble. It's not the Gibbs entropy for the canonical ensemble, which is essentially Shannon. Okay? This you have to be, uh, and he introduces also the Boltzmann entropy, which Boltzmann never really uh, actually introduced, because Boltzmann never wrote down the formula. This is actually a remark which I try to show for everybody doing quantum information and this so-called information from dynamics. My main message is here, there are a whole slew of entropies. Some of them have even many, many different names and means the same thing. The Groshi, Harvata, Java, Salis is actually identical, okay? So you can have the same entropy in different names. There are many, many entropies, but actually, which entropies are now thermodynamical entropy? This is now the issue. Well, of course, you, uh, you can uh, write down many such different entropies, but not. But it's dangerous to play with those entropies and make connection with thermodynamic relations. Because most of these entropies are information, some sort of information entropies, but have nothing to do with the thermodynamic entropy which enters the second law. Which enters the second law. Keep that in mind. Now, my entropy is basically kinds when I heard that. That is enough. Some people might remember that in many courses. You actually, most people, professors actually do not even talk about it. But this is now, so to speak, the volume entropy, or the Gibbs entropy, KP times N of the volume. You can normalize here, of course, with those factors here. Quantum mechanics is just uh, taking all the engineers, including the degeneracy, and then we can show by classical this, this, so to speak, what we saw in the Gibbs, apart from this factor. As we see here, just the density of states. And this is termed in the literature the Boltzmann entropy. So these two entities you find, for example, in most books of Huang and whatever. Okay. Now you wonder uh, which one should you use? Okay. Because you can do actually array equivalent, and sometimes in some books said, well, don't ask me, just calculate, shut up and calculate. Typically, it does not matter which one we use. I never liked this one when I asked my professor, what is, what is this funny epsilon not here? Because you, you need that in order to make it uh, with dimensionless, right? That's already not so nice, but of course, this can be discussed away. Derivatives don't depend on this epsilon on this scale. But nevertheless, we have now from dynamics of finite systems. For example, we have chaotic system that's simply oscillated. You can actually treat as a thermodynamic systems if you take it as an ensemble. I will show you that later. And then the question which entropy is now giving the absolute temperature. Now, the temperature is a derived quantity. Keep that in mind. It's a derived quantity. So whatever you use, you, you postulate, okay, we have this formula of, of Clausius, that the curator was reversible over T, but we, strictly speaking, do not know what T is. Clausius will tell you takes the temperature of a gas thermometer, for example. But if we have spins, you don't have a gas thermometer to measure the temperature of your uh, spins in the bottle. So you are lost. So actually, you have to postulate an entropy, and if you have the entropy, and you call and you think that this is the thermodynamic entropy, you can derive on your counter. I do assume at least mixing so everything is safe. So I can write down, so to speak, with micros canonical density function, density operator. And then of course the density of states is the trace, classical I showed you what it means, and you have the integrated density of states, which is actually the Gibbs entropy for the so-called microcanonical ensemble. And now you have hyper this is actually attributed with thing to Boltzmann. I have no time to tell you why Planck actually is responsible for this name Boltzmann, but actually it should be called Planck entropy. And this is, so to speak, what I call the Gibbs entropy, and which has heard, an author person has done a lot of nice work with it, which was hers. Now, as I say here, if you now have an entropy for the microeconomical ensemble, Boltzmann or Gibbs, the temperature is given by this expression, and now you see this Gibbs temperature is the total omega, which is positive, the integrated energy of state, omega is positive, the density is not negative, so this is always a positive number. But in Boltzmann, you have actually the positive omega here, and you have the mu here, but the derivative of the density of states is not always positive. It's always positive for almost all problems you solve as a student. It's also almost always 99% true for all systems you treat in a course or even in a, in a laboratory. 
But you will have problems, for example, if you have, for example, upper bouncing energy. Because you can have also on semiconductors, you can have non-monotonic density of states and things like that. And that, of course, is now the issue. What is now correct is with the absolute temperature or is the upper field temperature? And now, actually, there's a connection between these two temperatures, which is given here at the Okay, I was here. Now, I tell you that none of these temperatures should be actually taken uh, into a formulation of the second law. So, the, as any formulation of the second law which uses absolute temperature is in principle problematic, not to say in, in general wrong. That's why my notes are wrong, because I also shout all these heat flows from hot to cold. Yeah, that's you would think so. But if you hear now a density of states, which is actually plotted here, which is, so to speak, this density of state, here's the blue line, and this is the integrated density of state, and here I plot the so-called Boltzmann entropy, and the blue uh, is the blue stuff, and the red stuff is the, uh, is the derived uh, Boltzmann temperature. You, so you see here, uh, and this is the same thing for C Gibbs entropy, which of course is monotonic growing, so the temperature here is always positive, and the Boltzmann temperature here can be negative. First of all, you have positive, negative Boltzmann temperature, but you have only positive Gibbs temperature. But what is now important is that for a, you, for, you have here for a given entropy value, you have here now many, many energies, and you have, so to speak, here, uh, for, this, for to speak here, uh, for the, uh, that the temp so the Gibbs temperature can have many values. So the Gibbs temperature does not characterize the, uh, the which energy you have. You have to actually, the basic variable in a microcanonical description is not a derived quantity, because it, but it is the energy. If you know the energy, you can know the Gibbs temperature. You know this energy, you have this Gibbs temperature. You know, with a temperature, you don't know where are you here, or are you here, or where are you. That's why you cannot predict, already here you see, you cannot predict the flow of heat. If you bring two microeconomical systems, A and B, together, in general, if you have a density of states, which is actually here not monotonic in, in the energy, you cannot say that heat flows always from hot to cold. Okay. This is now, you see, this is the connection between the Boltzmann and the Gibbs temperature, which is, the Gibbs temperature is always positive. Now, another big thing which the most players in this field of information thermodynamics do not follow is which, in order to have an entropy concept, it should be consistent with all the laws of thermodynamics that you know. For example, this, if you don't have such a relation, the change of entropy is, so to speak, 1 over temperature dE, P over T minus P over T dV, etc., etc., where these are, so to speak, the derivatives. But uh, the most important thing which sometimes people realize, people say, oh, I have an entropy, and this may just identify this as minus pressure over T, for example. This is for, uh, if dN is here, then over pressure, you, you have the T, P pressure is T times dS dV. But it must be, in order to make a connection with the, uh, thermodynamics, this combination, whatever the S you use, should be minus the E dV, okay, of the internal and the rest of the volume. It is not sufficient just to play around here with thermodynamic relations. You have to show that actually this, any form of chosen entity is actually connect, connected with the thermodynamics, and this is actually uh, the thing which, which is most important for the consistency for the first law. Now you see, for example, for the Gibbs entropy, which is the first law here, we have all this risk. I mean, there are thousands of entropies where you can define the pressure, but only a few are minus the edge of this volume, for example. And here is the blue for the Gibbs. If you go through this line, uh, so this is obeyed for the Gibbs entropy, minus the edge the edge. It's important that we have here the theta function, detector functions, the heavy side functions, and because you don't have this heavy side function in, in the Boltzmann entropy, the Boltzmann entropy certainly will not obey this first law. Now you say it's all wrong in my, uh, what I calculate, no, it's not true, because we can show, in practice of course, you can show for many normal systems, the Boltzmann entropy is in value almost equal to the Gibbs entropy for, high, for particle numbers which are very large, because the Gibbs volume is almost the same as the final volume as the energy E. 
But nevertheless, if you have a finite number of systems, or you have actually a long-range forces and other things, the Boltzmann uh, temperature does not obey necessarily the first law of thermodynamics. Now I come to the, my favorite thing, namely the second law. The second law, I take now a formulation. How do you find now rigorous as a second law if we have two microcanonical systems, A and B? Of course, you wait for a long time. So S, the system A is in microcanonical equilibrium with a density operator, and B is in microcanonical with a density operator. Now you have actually co couple them weakly, so that the interaction energy can be neglected. All of the thermodynamics is only weak coupling. Now we can actually show that the total volume is actually convolution. It's not a product, that some people think. And then you can show that this total volume is, is, so to speak, always larger than the products of the volumes. And this goes back to a formulation of Planck, which is not written mathematically, only in words. He says the following, which is actually, which is the correct laws when you actually teach the second law. If you have bodies, which are, so to speak, taken part in a thermodynamic system, and you have body A and body B and body C, and they are in equilibrium, and we have an entropy, SA, SB, SC. Now you couple them together very weakly. Then the second law must say that the combined system of A, B, and B, and C, for example, must be larger than the entropies of the original state. And you know, in this formulation, there is no temperature appearing. There is no temperature appearing, right? It's only phase volume. And this is a rigorous law, and you see that this is obeyed by the Gibbs. And of course, you will see all what you hear about the Boltzmann entropy, which is so all condensed matter people calculate the density of states, which is of Green's function people, and then they say we know the entropy, period. Also, in the biophysics talk, I think we take the number of realizations. Uh, some permutation is on because SLN of, of a number of possibilities. This is a hand waving form. It's not really always the dynamic entity. I tell this to soft matter people like you. you have to, this, is, uh, this is an information entity, but not necessarily from dynamic. But all my friends put it in eventually into a free energy expression. Never mind with little criticism. Now, what more is more subtle is the zero flow of thermodynamics, which says you, so to speak, if three bodies are mutually equilibrium, we have the transit with the flow. And this, I think, I, uh, how much time I have left? Uh, ten minutes? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. So I will actually not go through, but this is a bit subtle. You have to go over here through this paper. Namely, if you now have a system A and a system B, and you combine them here, when the only thing you know at, at weak coupling is that the total energy, EA plus EB is the total energy E, energy conversation. But you do not know a priori what the, after you wait a long time, so you have A is in equilibrium, coupled to B is in equilibrium, so we have again mixing, but you do not know the value of EA. It's actually, uh, you have to calculate, so to speak, uh, the probability to uh, rho, which is a rho microcanonical delta EA minus HA, for example, if it's a, yeah, EA, this has no prime here, and this, the, uh, the trace of this, right, or, or I put it now as a parenthesis, this gives you, so to speak, the probability to measure, to find the energy EA, given that, and this row has the total energy E, given that you have for the combined system the total energy E. And if you go through this calculation, which is a bit tricky, you get actually, this is the probability to find the random energy EA given that the total energy EA plus E is E. And with this probability, you can now actually form the get Gibbs temperature of this particular random energy, weight it, and, and of course this gives you, because the energy is random and fluctuates, right? The temperature fluctuates, but essentially you have to take the average and then. With this definition of subsystem temperature, you can show that uh, the zero flow is rigorously obeyed. Any other entropy definition, unfortunately, like Boltzmann and other ones, will not obey that. And here in this paper, we have a list where actually the third, so to speak, the second law I proved to you, the first law I proved to you, the zero flow I only sketched, 
And this is equipartition, which is very nice because this goes back to pinching. It is obeyed only for the Gibbs definition. In Boltzmann, principally not, because you have errors uh, if the system is not extremely large or you have other problems if they come out and speak about. This is actually just flash it. It's, the equipartition is actually for a classical system rigorously obeyed for the Gibbs temperature, which is the, so the absolute temperature of a classical system is the Gibbs temperature. That's the T that should go in the Clausius 1 over T, right? If the ensemble is equivalent with the canonical one. This is actually rigorous and uh, there's no way around. This is not, never here's the Boltzmann temperature. It's not the Boltzmann temperature which enters. Okay, now we can uh, uh, go, so to speak, to some examples. You see, for example, if you take a, a methodic system like the ideal gas, you get here uh, for the Boltzmann temperature, you get the energy which is not quite, here it's obeyed exactly the equipartition, but here for low, for low particle numbers or low dimensions, and then this, for example, only two or only one, you get not the right result. So that shows that essentially with the Gibbs definition, you don't have these anomalies. So to speak, if you can do that, this is important enough for the rest what I say, because a, 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 an aquatic system like a particle in a box with the Boltzmann entropy, which is a microcanonical system, right? It's very, uh, it's aquatic. You get here a negative pressure, and with the Gibbs one, anyone knows that a particle in a single box must have a positive pressure. And now this comes to the issue of negative temperature, namely, which goes back to that famous experiment of uh, Purcell and Pound. And most, this is now the textbook value, uh, explanation for negative temperature. You have here n spin a half particles, and you have n spins in the ground state and n spins in the excited states. And here you use this, uh, so to speak, uh, combination rule for the density of states. And actually, they don't tell you that, but if they just say S is KP, and then only as we heard before, it's the number of possibilities to occupy that state. And now, uh, this is now, of course, the Boltzmann entropy, and if you now do a little calculation like that, you find the difference that the Boltzmann, uh, so to speak, the Boltzmann entropy is here, uh, it coincides with the Gibbs entropy, but here it has this net overturn, it's like parabolic. So you see the penny rate if it gives you negative temperatures, right? And here, see, the red line gives you actually always positive temperatures. And the same is actually a uh, little bit for, for, uh, for the magnetization. The magnetization is quite smooth for the Gibbs temperature, but at zero magnetization, you have a singularity, which is the point singularity if we would use the Boltzmann temperature, which is actually not said in any book I ever came across. Anyhow, and now there was a lot of, uh, 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 of news about realization of negative absolute temperature for motion degrees freedom, cold atoms, and so on. And this, as you know, unfortunately, most of the science is oversold. I wish uh, people would be more modest and don't they say sometimes what they really agree from show and not uh, try to oversell everything here. For example, negative temperatures, and we can use cold atoms to show Carnot engines greater than, efficiency greater than unity, or negative pressure. I told you a bit of the fact of negative pressure. When cold atoms might serve as an analog for dark energy, okay? So this sounds exciting, and you get accepted, but this is what I mean, a big misrepresentation of what they really show. And here, actually, we did the calculation for the system using now any deeply interacting bosons. And we say that we have the Boltzmann temperature, which is here negative, but the Gibbs temperature, which obeys the second law, the first law, and the zero law is beautifully positive. And we don't really, I would say, we may, this is all correct with the Boltzmann regulation, but we should not call it absolute temperature. It's not the correct absolute temperature. That's not my is because how can you actually really treat uh, 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 Boltzmann temperature? The fact that you can show that the single particle probability introduces not the Gibbs temperature, but so to speak, the Boltzmann temperature. And now here we have the issue of equivalence, because this single particle is like a canonical description. You have n particles, and you pick one out. You have n minus one is acting as a bath, and the one particle is so to speak the canonical. Uh, system. And you see in this case, microcanonical and canonical do not have the same temperature. So microcanonical at T Gibbs 
and canonical you get T Boltzmann. There's no way around that. And uh, what I come to is a conclusion. Population inversion, which gives you negative temperature, must be isolated. So we have never a physical system and you couple it to an environment, you cannot get <coughs> inversion. Bounded spectrum is also but are not equivalent. That's what was my last statement, right? You cannot really say that like a canonical and, and canonical is a totally different uh, situation if you let the spin system interact with the so in state body, you have to wait long enough, it, it's a totally different experiment than if you have isolated spins. The people claim that they have isolated spins. Now, uh, consistent thermodynamics singles out the Gibbs entropy, I'm sorry to say, even though people might not like it, and the temperature is always positive, it's the absolute temperature. No car efficiency is fortunately larger than one in our formulations. And as I say, many, many other things with many other uh, details and footnotes which go back to people which think there's something incorrect or something might be not okay, you find in this article which came out just about three weeks ago, had excellent reports and the editor's choice, but nevertheless you find already now really some articles from people on the archive which say that with, with uh, disparaging language, no, no, Boltzmann is always correct and so on, but uh, I can't, how can I... And they say we violate the second law, but as I told you, if I violate the second law, I shoot myself, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. The Landover limit about uh, how much energy is being spent when you do you the mean, one uh, bit of calculation. Uh, Beyond our limit, you respect KTLN2, right? Uh, yeah, this is some two erasers. Is it just a, a, a confused mixture of terms or is there anything behind yeah, this it? This is, of course, opening Pandora's box. There's a, there's a lot of uh, activity in the issue of how much does it cost to read off information. And there's this lambda allocator which says, okay, the minimum amount of energy we have to pay is KTL and 2. First of all, this is derived on the specific conditions which are never specified, namely on the, what I call no correlation between system and, uh, system and the measurement apparatus. So to speak, and all those proofs, if you take now information theory, Shannon measures, you will get, of course, what you get, you get KTL and 2. If you take thermodynamic entropy, which is another issue, for example, if a system coupled to a bath, it's not necessarily always the Shannon entropy of a canonical ensemble of what a normal system has final interaction, then it's not anymore the von Neumann entropy, for example, in the tension of quantum information. And then there is actually one paper where you say actually you can go below KTL2. Okay, and there's a big, a big uh, debate now. What actually goes into the calculation of KT of the information you're raising? You have to take the preparation, you have to take everything into account. And most people which also get, for example, efficiency larger than one, they never take into account, for example, there are papers now, efficiency larger than one, non-equivalent paths. But they don't take into account to, to prepare a non-equivalent path. It takes a hell of a lot of energy. So uh, a lot has to do with definition physics, but in this case of the non limit, it has to do also on the, its information entropy, not from the dynamic entropy. So the heat, the you know, conversion from heat, entropy on going to heat is debatable. Okay? That's a very tough question, but I thought long about it. Okay.